and amen. Um, so I don't have a title for this message, um, but the Lord, when I was praying about this, I had a lot of resistance uh, this week. How many people have like off weeks? That was me this week. I was, I was feeling attacked. I was feeling oppressed. Um, and it just makes sense because, you know, the Lord wants to take me out and, and the, de- <laughs> the, devil, the devil's trying to take me out. Thank you, Pastor. See, that's why, that's why he's the boss. That's why he's the boss. He's got to correct me like this. Also, side note, who chose the color for this? Who chose salmon pink the day that I'm trying to, to preach? I need like a strong blue or like a, something very masculine. I, t- I took one of these like, like what, what was that quiz thing? The masculine? What was like the, yeah, polarity? I took a polarity quiz and I guess I tested like on the more feminine qualities. So I'm really kind of fed up about that. I'm kind of fed up. And the fact that y'all chose pink for this is not it. I'm kind of, I'm kind of upset about it. But as I was preparing for this message, um, I didn't get a title, but the Lord said, I want them to leave with three things. Um, And I want you to teach them what faith is, how do I increase in my faith, and how do I operate in faith. And I feel that God wants to raise up a generation of young people to know and have faith in God, to increase their faith, and to operate in the fullness of God's word, and to operate in faith. And I feel like it is so timely for all of you guys here. So what is faith? In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I want you guys to imagine this. I want you to imagine you guys are at home looking out your window. It's a windy day, and you just see trees blowing, right? You see the trees blowing. You see the, the branches swaying. You see the leaves falling off, and you see that tumbleweed in the middle of the street. And I want you guys to imagine this. You don't see wind, right? You can't, if you put under a microscope, you don't see wind, right? Just like how you don't see Jesus, right? You don't see Jesus with your physical eyes. You don't feel him. You don't give him a hug. Jesus is not standing next to me right now, but you feel the effects of him. That the moment you step outside of your house, you begin to feel the wind pressing on your face. You begin to feel the wind blowing on you. That's how Jesus is in your life. You you have faith in something that you can't see, but you're convinced that it's real. And you feel the effects of it in your life. That's how Jesus is in your life. And that's how we operate in faith. We need to have faith in Jesus and the promises that he has laid out for us. How do I increase my faith? In Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So how do I increase my faith? You hear. You hear the word of God. And I'm not saying hear, but hear, right? I want you guys to hear it in your hearts, because it's so easy to hear something and dismiss it right away, right? We want to be people that meditate on the word of God, that once it goes in here, it goes down into here. We don't want to be people that hear it, receive it with gladness, like, oh, that's so good, and then you forget it the next day. Like, we want to be people that hear the word of God, right? We want to be people that hear it, and when we hear it, we receive it with gladness, and then we do something about it, right? We want to be people that operate in faith, and that's how we increase it. We need to meditate on God's word. The word meditate means to think deeply or focus on one's mind for a period of time. So we need to focus. When we meditate on the word, we must focus and take time. Take time to simmer in it. Take time to to allow it to marinate in your life and allow it to to get into your heart. In Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates in it day and night. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his and he meditates in it day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So we're given this metaphor in this scripture about a tree being planted by water, right? And then obviously it's talking about the tree is us as Christians, and the, the, the streams of water is the word of God that we're planted by. And we need to be people that are planted by the word of God, that meditate in it day and night, that the more that we meditate in it, the more our faith increases, the more that we begin to believe in the fullness of God 
And that's what we should do. And it compares those people as people who are strong and who are planted and rooted and that when storms come, you are not shaken. But when storms come, your leaf won't even wither, that you bear fruit in your season, that we need to be people who are planted by rivers of water. In Joshua 1.8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according that all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. It's talking about not allowing the word of God to depart from your mouth, but meditate in it day and night. It says take delight in his word, that we need to be people that delight in the word of God. To observe according to all that is written in it, that's just like meditating. To observe and do according to all that is written in it, that's meditating on the word of God. For then, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. That when you meditate, and then when you apply it to your life, then you will be prosperous. Then you will begin to see the fruit of your life, uh, of your life begin to come to pass, and that everything that you put your hand to will prosper. I want you guys to recognize that the word of God is not a chore to read. That it's not something that we have to do, but it's something that we get to do, right? That the word of God, it's active, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. I want you guys to know the value of God's word. I want you to recognize that it is of more benefit that you read it than to not read it, right? I want you to recognize that there is promises laid out, that there is blueprints in your life that the word of God gives you. I want you to think about when you bowl, right? When you go bowling, that you get the bumpers, right? That's God's word in your life, right? That even if you totally just like close your eyes and like, whoa, throw it that way, like you got the guardrails and you'll keep going and you'll get that strike. You'll still hit the pins and that's how God's word is in your life. That when you throw a bowling ball, that when you begin to run towards something, you run towards a giant, that the word of God begins to guide you and you begin to attack that giant, right? Amen. The eyes and ears are the doorways to the heart. That the eye, it talks about in the Bible how the eyes and the ears are the doorways to the heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it shall eat its fruit. So we live in this constant cycle of where our eyes and our ears, the things that we allow into our hearts, the things that we are watching, the friends that we hang out with, the things that we're doing, maybe we're ignorant to it, but we allow these things into our eyes and ears, and it gets down into our hearts. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And in the Bible, it talks about a ship is controlled by a rudder, right, a small rudder. And, and it, it's just like that in our lives, right? That our, our, the whole direction of our life is controlled by our tongue. That when we speak something, we follow it, right? It's just like that with a ship. That the, the rudder of a ship controls the entire trajectory and direction of where the ship goes. And that's the same thing with our mouths. So what are you allowing into your eyes and ears? What are some things in your life that you're getting comfortable with? And you're saying, hey, that's just a part of my life. That's just who I am. What friends are you hanging out with that are the best influences on your life? What are some things that you are allowing to sow into your heart and are completely damaging the, tra the trajectory of where you're going? I want you guys to think about that. I want you to allow the word of God to be implanted in your eyes and ears that it will grow your faith to the point where you speak in faith. The third question, how do I operate in faith? God's word will then equip you to walk effectively in your calling, right? As we walk out in our faith, we begin to understand the faithfulness of God. That the minute we try God, God meets us, right? That the minute that we step out in faith, God is like, all right, I'll meet you, right? Amen. That the faithfulness of God will come to, pla will come to pass um, when we ask him, right? We need to ask God, right? A lot of us don't even ask God for things to come to pass in our life. If you're believing for something and if you're asking God, God, I need this in my life. God, please save me from this. Please show me this. Please get me out of this. 
God will meet the measure in which you ask, right? So if you're asking for big things, God will meet, God will meet you in a big way, right? And if you're asking in a small way, God will meet you in a small way, right? Don't limit God. Do not limit God on what he could do in your life. God will meet you in the measure of which you ask, right? So ask big, that when you meditate on God's word, that when you allow it into your heart, you're like, man, I'm stirred. I'm stirred with the faithfulness of God. Ask big. Don't limit God. Ask God for Angel Stadium, right? Ask God for a stadium, and he'll give it to you. Ask God to provide all of your financial needs, and he'll provide it. Amen? But if you ask small, if you're like, God, I got rent. God, I need like two grand this month. I need, just give me like 500 bucks. That'll be good. Mm, Right? Don't do that, right? You're limiting God. You're limiting God. Nothing is too hard for God. If you ask small, he'll give you small. But if you ask big, he will provide all of your needs. So when you, when you sow the word of God into your heart, you'll begin to, it'll begin to just come out naturally. It'll be like, hey, when something happens, when a storm comes, you're like, nah, my God is bigger than that. My, my God is bigger than any circumstance. My God is bigger than any storm. That you begin to declare the faithfulness of God. That as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord, who are called according to his purposes. That my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. That by his stripes I am healed. And thanks be to God who always leads me into triumph. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper in Jesus' name. It is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by his spirit in Jesus' name. That when you sow the word of God, when you, sow, when you meditate on the word of God, you will begin to speak the word of God. And when you have faith and you have the, ma- the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. You can move a mountain in Jesus' name. There is nothing too hard for God. Oh, let me tell you, this is a funny story. (laughs) Oh, I was wrestling with this. I was like, bro, Lord, I should not say this. Bro, Lord, I should not call Lord that. Sorry, Lord. (sighs) But let me tell you something. God is faithful in the big things and in the little things, right? If you ask big, he'll meet you. And and even like the smallest of worries, God will meet it. He's so faithful, right? So there was, a, there was an all-staff meeting. Oh, man. There was an all-staff meeting earlier this week, right? And your boy had to use the restroom, okay? I had to use the restroom. You know, I had to go drop the kids off, right? See, Lord, I shouldn't have done it. I had to go drop the kids off, right? So I go to the bathroom, and I'm like, dude, it's just routine. Nothing out of the ordinary. It was nothing crazy, like, not even, like, crazy. It was just routine bathroom, right, that we all do. I flush, clog the toilet. <laughs> Completely clog the toilet. I get up, I'm like, there's no way. This is the only bathroom in this entire office. Like, there's no way. Water begins to pour out, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And I'm like, there's no way. I'm seriously, like, contemplating. I'm like, should I just leave? Like, I, like <laughs> just, just let, just have, like, the facilities guy, Alex, like, clean it up. Like, just... <laughs> Just not even worry about it. Oh, my gosh. And I'm just like, no. I come to my senses. I'm like, no, I shouldn't do that. I should totally, like, tell somebody about this, you know, or blame it on somebody else, like Pastor Jonathan or something. (laughs) But in that moment, I'm, like, puzzled. I'm, like, frozen. I'm like, what? There's, like, water on the ground. I'm like, there's, that's insane. This is so embarrassing. And I, in that moment, I pray. I'm like, God, like, please, like, send somebody. Like, this is so bad. Like, I don't want, like, Pastor Carl to walk in, and he's just totally like, oh, praise the Lord, what is that? Like, like, I do not want that to happen, right? And I literally pray in that moment, puzzled in a bathroom stall with water on the floor, and I'm like, Lord, please, like, send somebody, or, like, I just need your help. And the moment that I walk outside, I see Alex Sierra, our facilities guy. Isn't God good? Isn't God so good? I prayed and I asked God, I'm like, God, is, God, you are faithful in the big things and the little things in Jesus' name. I prayed and God met me there um, in the form of Alex. And of course, like, I, I like helped him. I didn't like want him to do it. That's my homie. I didn't want him to clean it up all by himself. But isn't God so good? He's faithful in the big, can we give it up for God? Amen. <laughs> He will save your embarrassment, but I'm, like, literally embarrassing myself right now on this stage, but praise the Lord. 
be expectant and walk as if you already have it. God never misses it. It's always us, right? God is always hitting the mark. It's always a matter of us missing it, right? There's always something internally that we're dealing with. There's always something that, that we miss, right? And I pray that it's not us. I want to end with this passage. It's the, the passage of Peter walking on water and Jesus calling him out. And I, I just want to read it. It's Matthew 14, verse 24 to 31. And this is out of the message translation. It says, meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when the wind came up against them and they were battered by the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. They were scared to death. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. How many of y'all are grateful that Jesus is quick to come for you? Courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter, Peter, suddenly bold. Peter, suddenly filled with faith said, Master, if it's really you, call me to come to you on the water. He said, come, come ahead. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. But when he looked down at the waves churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and started to sink. Jumping out of the boat. So Peter is jumping out of the boat, and he's literally doing a miracle. He's walking on water. And a lot of the times we step out on the boat, and we're literally in a miracle, right? And, that, and when Peter messed up is when he looked down. Peter, when Peter messed up is when he looked down. That when he was looking at Jesus, everything was okay. He was looking at the very person that was holding him up in that moment, right? And Peter messed up when he looked down, when he lost sight of Jesus. And he began to understand the circumstances surrounding him. He began to understand that the issues in his life the insecurity that he's dealing with, the struggle, the bondage, the sin. He began to look down, and he grew afraid. He began to doubt. And he began to sink. But I want you guys to see what happens. He cried out, Master, save me. Jesus, save me. Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand. Then he said, faint heart, what got into you? And I imagine how many times that I've cried out to God when I've missed it, when I've missed the mark, I've cried out, God, save me, God, save me. And he did not hesitate to pull me up. And it says in the Bible that he is faithful to those who are faithless, right? He is faithful to those, and he's so gracious that his mercies are new every single morning, that he's faithful to those who miss the mark. And that the moment that we cry out, Jesus, save me, he is not going to hesitate. He is not going to hesitate to look at you in the eyes and pick you up from your situation and your circumstance and plant you back on your feet. And what I love about Jesus, what he did, he wasn't furious at Peter. He wasn't laying down the law. He wasn't chewing him out. He said, I just think of this in the tenderest way possible. He said, faint heart, what got into you? Why did you lose faith? Why did you doubt? Right? I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful for God that he's so quick to pull you up. He's so quick to not hesitate regardless of our mistakes, regardless of our mishaps. He's so faithful to pick us back up. And I want to ask you this. What boat do you feel that God is calling you out of? What are some things that you are believing for God to do? And I want to share a testimony of a time in my life where Jesus called me out of a boat. It was a time I was dating a girl. I was dating her for about three years. Thought she was the one, like, you know, like in high school, just like, what? She's like it. She's the one, you know? And I remember God telling me, you know, we were a good relationship. We didn't fight. We didn't have all these problems, but we were a good relationship. And God told me, she's not the one. That's not it. No, are you sure? Like, I think you're missing it. I feel called. I feel like, I feel like she's, like, I'm, I'm on this earth for a reason to bring her to the Lord. Like, you begin, no, you begin to, like, convince yourself of things. Or, like, when God's telling you one thing, you're like, no, you're completely wrong. But, like, God knows everything. Literally, like, God knows everything. And I'm like, no, I'm struggling with this. And then one day, um, I just reached out to my, my best friend. And I told him, man, like, 
I think I got to break up with her. I think I have to do it. God's telling me to do it. And um, how many of y'all are thankful for godly friends and accountable friends, right? And he prayed for me. He comforted me. And, you know, he's somebody that isn't going to tell me what I want to hear, but he's going to tell me something that I need to hear, you know. And, and I'm so grateful for that. But I did it. I went to pick up my girlfriend. Um, we talked. I, I broke up with her. And um, I just remember driving away. And I remember feeling this lightness. I remember feeling like almost like flying, you know. I was just, it was just the most surreal thing. And I remember in that moment, God told me, Jared, now you could run. Jared, there's nothing holding you back. There's no more weights in your life, but you can run after me. There is nothing holding you back. And ever since then, God has shown himself strong in my life. It says that the eyes of the Lord look to and fro on this earth, looking for those whose hearts are loyal to him, and that he will show himself strong on their behalf. And I just remember in that moment, God said, now you can run, Jared. Now you can run after me. There is nothing holding you back, that there is blessing in your obedience, Jared, that I'm not just going to leave you out to dry, that I'm going to bless the very thing that you committed to, that you surrendered to me fully, that you had faith in me, that you stepped out on the boat, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So what is something that God is calling you out of? What are some things that you feel that God is calling you to believe in? In faith, right? And I'm going to end with this verse. In Lamentations 3, 22 to 23 in the NLT, it says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Great is God's faithfulness in your life. Whether it's calling you out of something, you got to be obedient to something, or whether it's something that you're believing for. Great is his faithfulness. He is faithful to those who believe him. He is faithful to those, even those that miss it. He is faithful to those to the end. Whether you're speaking to a giant or whether you clogged a toilet, God is faithful to those. I'm serious. God is faithful to everyone. And as we go into this song, I ask the band to come up and sing this song. It's called Promises by Maverick City. And the chorus is, great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. And I want you guys to sow this into your heart. As you sing it, sow the word of God into your heart and begin to believe unto the Lord Jesus Christ and believe unto him that he is one who is willing and able to perform his promises in your life. Do not limit God in this moment. Do not miss out on this moment where God is trying to tap onto your heart and pull you forward and call you up from the water. God is calling you up in this moment. So as we go into this song, can we, can we all stand? Can we all stand in this moment in a time of response? I want you guys to worship. I want you guys to be transparent in this moment with God. I want you to talk to him. I want you to call upon the Lord. I want you to ask him for the impossible because he can perform the impossible. I want you guys to lay it at Jesus' feet right now. Listen to his voice. He is always speaking. He is always knocking on the door of your heart. Allow him in in this moment. Can we all lift our hands? Can we all lift our hands as a sign of surrender? Don't be afraid. Don't, don't worry about what your neighbor is doing. Can we all lift our hands and begin to acknowledge and worship our King?